I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. Jean O'Leary was a troublemaker. I don't think she'd argue with that description. She went to an all-girls Catholic school in Cleveland, where she earned a reputation as a cut-up. Jean held the record for the most detentions ever. What she called her baby pranks included setting off fire alarms and holding dances in the auditorium during lunch. Jean also fell in love over and over again, beginning as far back as third grade. She loved girls, plain and simple. In the 1960s, that was anything but simple. Once Jean came to terms with who she was, she got to work. Her activism in the LGBTQ civil rights movement spanned more than 30 years and took her from a convent in Ohio to a contentious rally in New York City's Washington Square Park to a landmark meeting at the White House. Here's the scene. I meet Jean at her office in North Hollywood. First we go to a nearby cafe and then continue our conversation at the Ivy, a very gay-friendly restaurant on the border of Los Angeles and West Hollywood. Jean is casually dressed in slacks and a blouse. She has thick, brown, close-cropped hair. She couldn't have been more open and thoughtful. And funny. She had a great laugh and a dazzling smile. Before I even set up my tape recorder, we are deep in conversation. So we'll pick up her story after she ran away from a marriage proposal to live in a convent. The convent was great. It was um, one of the best experiences of my life on every single level. When I got there, um, I wasn't there for more than six months when I really did come out. And so I came out sexually. Emotionally, it was incredible. We had um, a priest who was a therapist who came in and ran sensitivity groups. And if you want to talk about living in a closed environment, and being in sensitivity groups and sort of stripping down the defenses and then going away and living with these same people for 24 hours a day, day in and day out. We were on a a villa at the Novitiate. And so we didn't go off that villa either. So the intensity was really intense. We were up to all hours of the night. We would go smoke in the cafeteria or, you know, do whatever. And um, I was always in love. (laughs) I had like eight relationships while I was in there. Oh my God. I know. God was an innocent bystander. (laughs) In fact, I had an affair with a postulant mistress, which was a very deep affair. At the same time, I was having an affair with Bunny, and the priest was involved with both of them, but not sexually. But it was a real sort of a balancing kind of an act. I went in and told him, I said, I think I'm a homosexual. So um, anyway, he said basically, well, don't you think that, you know, it's just just because we're in the same sex environment, really. And um, these feelings are just natural, and we just have to try to be celibate. Great. You said? I said, fine, you know. But it was so debilitating to me because I was ready to come out. I was ready to tell the truth. And everybody was ready to cover it up again, or he was. That was your coming out? It was, yeah. Had you even said it verbally to yourself? Verbally spoken, I mean. No. 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 You'd never spoken the words no. before? No, uh-uh. no. Not, not with an I attached to it. I am, you know. <laughs> Can you remember that? Can you remember saying that to him? Yes. How vivid is that? Oh, it's extremely vivid. And, and I remember all the feelings afterwards, too. Because it was like, this is it. And then i got to get out of here. Because um, I don't belong here. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. But, you know, this is it. And then I tell him. And he, like, glosses over the whole thing because he didn't want to hear it. He said I was a very interesting person. Very vivid. Very open. And he wanted to analyze my dreams. And I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> so I went out and... I remember going out and sitting in this silo that was empty. And it just was sort of a person like not a personification, but an, an emphasis of what I was feeling in terms of the loneliness, the emptiness, the not being heard, the, oh my God, I finally said it, and this is what I get back. How yeah, did you get from that long. silo? How did I get from out of it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, how did I? You must I have stayed around for a while. In the silo. No, in the convent. I mean, I don't remember how long I was in the silo. <laughs> but I remember coming out, and I remember talking to my friend, Linda, who was in her dorm, and almost telling her what had happened, but not quite. You weren't ready yet. Mm-mm. It's 
especially now that I've been saved one more time, huh? You know? <laughs> saved from the truth that I really wanted to. You know what I mean? Everybody was in collaboration. It's like that conspiracy of silence. And even when you're ready to break out of it, it's not easy. People don't want to hear it. Jean did make it out of the convent. In 1971, she moved to Brooklyn to a studio apartment that came with a male roommate who turned out to be gay. Together, they went to their first Gay Activist Alliance meeting, and that was the beginning of Jean's decades-long involvement in the movement. In the end, Jean had no regrets about leaving the convent. But there were other things she regretted in her life. And you're about to hear one of those things. It's 1973, and Jean is at the Gay Pride Rally in Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. By then, she'd led a split of the women from the Gay Activist Alliance and formed a new organization called Lesbian Feminist Liberation. Jean's group was protesting the rally organizers' decision to include drag queens as part of the entertainment. While Jean and other LFL members were passing out flyers to the crowd, Sylvia Rivera took the stage and made her now famous speech. You all tell me to go and hide my tail between my legs. I will not for longer put up with this shit. I have been beaten. I have had my nose broken. I have been thrown in jail. I have lost my job. I have lost my apartment for gay liberation. And you all treat me this way? What the fuck's wrong with you all? Think about that. The people that are trying to do something for all of us and not men and women that belong to a white middle class, white club, and that's what you all belong to. Revolution now! Jean was reluctant to talk about what happened. The Jean I was sitting with outside the Ivy was not proud of what her 25-year-old self had done. This is so embarrassing. You're not going to print this, are you? (laughs) You know... (laughs) I hate this because, you know, I, oh well, anyway. Let me tell you why it's important. What it shows is, is the evolution of, of thought and how we are, how we got to where we are now, why you think the way you do now. And you didn't come to where you are now without having gone through okay, all of this. Okay, just so long as you can really put it in context. I tr- I'll, I'll trust you more as we go along. The whole book, I have to put the whole book in context because some of the things people did and said, yeah. they can't believe what they said and did. I mean, this is really something but this was at a time when the sexism was just rampant between men and women in the gay community how did, how did the sexism show itself well it was blatant it was the men um, actually treated women like surrogate mothers lovers sisters um, the women's role should be respected and that's where you are there was uh, very little, few women in leadership positions, and they were consciously kept out of them. Because just as gay people, you know, have to become visible in society, lesbians had to become visible because whenever people said gay, they always thought about gay men. We sat around actually for months and tried to figure out what were the women's issues that were different from feminist issues or different from gay issues. And quite frankly, to this day, no one has been able to come up with what those issues are. But it's a matter of attitude, it's a matter of positioning, it's a matter of respect, it's a matter of power, it's a matter of all those types of things, which are a little more subtle. And um, so what, and visibility, of course, visibility, just having people realize that there are lesbians in the world. And when you say gay, it has to include gay men and women. Um, so the, I guess the thing with the transvestite, I would never do this now, <laughs> but um, in those days, was like, well, here's a man dressing up as a woman and wearing all the things that we're trying to break free of. Such as? High heels, girdles, corsets, stockings, um, all the things that were just sort of binding women. And um, so we just decided to make a statement. We stayed up that night and typed up this little statement on the typewriter. We, we actually worked all night on it, and I'm sure it was just some small statement. Because we were knocking out theory at that time. So it wasn't just like we were, you know, writing off a paragraph of something. I mean, we were actually creating theory. And the discussion was, well, but there are laws on the books in the state. 
if the person had on more than three items of clothing of the other person's sex, then um, they could be called on that. And so they said, well, that must mean the women, and we could all be thrown in jail for cross-dressing, and so we really shouldn't criticize. We should try to kind of support this kind of thing. So then we decided that, okay, well, we're not going to attack cross-dressing. We'll attack um, men who do it for profit as opposed to do it for a statement. So Vito Russo was a very good friend of mine, and we had a falling out over this issue, but he was still trying to be a trying to accommodate. Actually, I think he helped me come up on the stage because I was not scheduled as a scheduled speaker. So I got up there. On the stage? On the stage. In front of how many people? Oh, I mean, you know, tens of thousands, whatever it was. It wasn't, you know, the 200,000 we have nowadays, but it was quite a few. And I remember that then I got up there, and this is a little hazy. I don't remember the whole thing because, I mean, you're in the situation. <laughs> Lesbian feminist liberation negotiated for a week and a half using the means that rational women and women have always used in the past, not disruptive means, to try to get up here and read a statement. We were told no, that there would be no political statements read today because one person, a man, Sylvia, gets up here and causes a ruckus, we are now allowed to read our statement. And I think that says something right there. Now, I'd like to go on and speak, but I have written here a statement that is backed up by a hundred women. And this was voted on, so I'm just going to read this statement. So, I read the statement. What did you say? Well, that we at the Lesbian Feminist Liberation protest the um, cross-dressing of men in women's clothes for, for purposes of profit. And we wanted to make that statement clear. When men impersonate women for persons for reasons of entertainment or profit, they insult women. We we support the right of every person to dress in the way that she or he wishes. But we are opposed to the exploitation of women by men for entertainment or profit. Men have been telling us who we are all our lives. They have tried to do it with scholarship, with religion, with psychiatry. When all else fails, they have used humor to tell us and each other who and what we are. What we object to today is another instance in which men laughing with one another at what they present as women are telling us who they think we are. We don't want to know. Men have never been able to show us ourselves. We are coming into a time and a place as women at which we can and do show one another who we are. Let men tell each other what they think of women. Let us tell you who we are. There was an incredible reaction. I mean, there was a lot of hostility. Men and women started fighting with each other out in the crowd. Physically or, or there verbally? There was some physical. There was a lot of verbal. I don't know what happened after that. I remember leaving. I can tell you what happened. Okay, what happened? <clears throat> uh, another drag queen got up on the stage who was living mm. and referred to you as those bitches, I believe. Mm. Um, Maybe that's what started the fight. It's because he said that we, you know, the Queen started the Stonewall riot, and you're not going to kick us out of the movement. Mm -hmm. um, so that, do you recall him getting up there at all? Vaguely now, I do, vaguely. I don't have a picture of it, but I do remember that. I remember getting off the stage and walking through the crowd. I was alone for some reason. And um, everybody had gone every which way, and I guess we were going to meet over at Bonnie and Clyde's, which was right around the corner. And we went in there to meet... And I think that's where we heard that Bette Midler had come down <laughs> to, to sort of smooth things over and saying, you know, you got to be friends. And how did that happen? I don't think I was there when to see her actually do that because I don't recall it. I just was like, okay, bye. <laughs> I wasn't, it wasn't that I was running away from it. Mm -hmm. But I remember I was out of there. It's like I'd done my thing and now let's get out of here. Let's leave. This is hard. Yeah, looking back on it, why are you embarrassed by that now? Um because I have since then, I mean, I've gone during the Anita Bryant campaign, for instance, um, down in Dade County, Florida. I used to go down there and help them with the, the campaign. And I'd stay at the Windward Hotel, which was just full of transvestites, transsexuals, wonderful, darling, lovable people that I got to know as people and got to know their lives and their stories and um, who they are, why they were. And, you know, you just, as you grow older, you First of all, you learn more and you mellow. 
terms of your precision about what has to be exactly right and politically correct. And right now, I have, I like, it's, it's hard even to be tolerant for myself of exact political correctness. And I know that I went through it, and I have to have patience with the people you know, that come up now that are going through the same thing, because it's a process. It is a process. Later, Jean said to me, how could I work to exclude transvestites and at the same time criticize the feminists who were doing their best back in those days to exclude lesbians? She was right. If you haven't heard it yet, go back and listen to the very first episode of season one, my interview with Sylvia Rivera, where she talks about the anger and hurt she felt that her people were sidelined in the movement. I spent a lot of time talking with Jean during two visits back in 1989 and 1990. There were so many stories to choose from, and that's why we'll be back soon with a special extra episode about when Jean took the first group of gay rights activists into the White House in 1977. It's a little hard to imagine now, but it was national news. I'll also be sharing a couple of secrets with you about that meeting that have never been told before. The archive tape you've heard from the 1973 rally in Washington Square Park is from footage shot by the Lesbians Organized for Video Experience Collective, or LOVE. If you're interested in donating to or using the Love Collective tapes, please contact Tracy Fitz, that's Tracy with a Y, tracy at innerbeing.net, or the Lesbian Herstory Archives. A big thank you to the folks who make this podcast happen each week. Producer Sarah Birmingham, mentor, friend, and co-producer Jenna Weiss-Berman, audio engineer Casey Holford, our website designer Jonathan dozier Ezel, and social media consultant Will Coley. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division. Season two of this podcast is made possible with support from the Ford Foundation, which is on the front lines of social change worldwide. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe to Making Gay History on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, NPR One, and wherever you get your podcasts. So long until next time.